Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders and sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. Let's jump into the conversation for today. Welcome to Conversations, a podcast provided by the Center for Thriving Leaders, sponsored by Grace Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Trent Lambert, and we are here to help leaders thrive in ministry. So without any further ado, let's jump into the conversation for today. Today, I am blessed and honored to have on the line with me um, one of our staff members, faculty members here at Grace College and Seminary at the Akron location, Dr. Gary College. Welcome to the program, Gary. Thanks, Trent. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation to be here. We're always excited to hear what's going on at the Akron location, and we'll, we'll jump into that here in just a second. But let me tell everyone, our listeners, a little bit about Dr. Gary College. Dr. Gary College lives in Akron, Ohio, with his wife, Maria, his wife of 47 years this upcoming June. They are the parents of four grown children and have six grandchildren. Gary holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from Heidelberg College from 1975, a Master's of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Ashland Theological Seminary in 1982, and a Ph.D. from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland in 2008. Gary has taught and pastored and taught prospective pastors and ministry leaders for nearly 50 years. His discipline in biblical studies with an emphasis in New Testament studies and Jesus studies, a significant aspect of his teaching responsibilities has been the teaching of scriptural interpretation, known as hermeneutics, and courses for Grace College in Akron and Grace Seminary in Akron. He has also taught biblical studies for Moody and the Bible Institute's remote programs, both online and distance learning classrooms. Gary is currently an instructor at Grace College and Seminary in the Akron location and serves officially as the faculty support specialist there overseeing faculty and academic programs. Once again, Gary, thanks so much for spending your time with us today. Well, it's a, it's a joy to be able to do that, and I don't know who that was that you read about, but uh, <laughs> sounds good to me. Well, thanks for that, Trout. I appreciate it. Gary, I've always enjoyed our conversations, and it's always exciting to hear what's going on in Akron. So before we jump in, why don't you just tell us a little about the Akron campus and what God is doing in Ohio? Yeah, for those who might not be familiar with what's going on here in Akron, Grace College has partnered with uh, Grace Church or Grace Churches of Akron. It's a large church. Pastor Jeff Bogue is the, the lead pastor there eight different campuses. Uh, they have a vision for planting 30 churches in 30 years. And of course, if you're going to do something like that, uh, you want to staff those churches and you want to staff them well. So Grace Church uh, reached out to Grace College, said, hey, can we start something here to help train pastors and leaders uh, for these churches that we want to plant? over the next 30 years. And of course, uh, Grace College through the, the SPO office with Tim Zevert and Trent, you were there at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, doing this with us. And so that has grown over the last, I, I think we're starting our eighth year. Um, so we offer a, a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, church leadership. Um, it's, a, it's a very focused degree uh, for for training and educating leaders for the church. We're excited about it, and I know uh, the Grace churches are excited about it as well. So, um, yeah, we do, we're we starting our, just started our, our spring uh, semester, second half of that, um, and we've had a we've had a great go up at this year. Uh, and a couple of years ago, we, we worked with Grace churches to establish the seminary program there. So mm -hmm. that's going as well. So, uh, yeah, a lot of exciting things happened here, yeah. happening here in that regard uh, with with the Grace Churches and Grace College. It has been exciting to watch the program in Akron grow and develop, and I know we certainly have the right man at the helm, um, Gary, with that being you over there. So we have great trust in you, and you're doing a phenomenal job. Gary, right now, let, let's say that we have someone listening from the Akron area and they're saying, you know what, I live in that area, not far away. How can I learn more about the program? Certainly they can get a hold of the Winona campus, 
Um, but can can they get a hold of you, Gary, or something over there? How how can people over there get more information? Yeah, they can contact me. That might be the best place to start, uh, I, and I will direct them uh, to the people they need to talk to. Probably uh, Shannon Simmons, who helps with recruitment and retention and those types of things. So, uh, yeah, they're welcome to contact me to, to uh, start that conversation. And, and Gary, what is your Grace email that listeners could write down? Yeah, C O L L E D G at grace.edu. Make sure you write that down if you're in the Akron area and interested in an undergrad or seminary education and ministry. And I'm sure Dr. College would be glad to speak with you and um, get you signed up and enrolled in an exciting program there in Akron, Ohio. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. You know, Gary, all of all of our listeners, well, one of the things that I just love to start with is is talking about family. Family is dear to me. You and I have spent time talking about our families. And so I know I read in your bio a little bit, but how about, could you just tell the listeners a little bit what your family looks like and tell us about your family? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I love to talk about my family. We, uh, um, yeah, to, for instance, um, tonight, uh, it's Friday night, we will get together with, uh, I have, I have, three daughters and a son, and they're kind of all over the place in the Midwest, not more than a day away, but uh, still far enough away that we don't see them a lot. So I have my daughter and her husband, and our three children are here in Akron. I have a daughter in Nashville. I have a daughter in Jenison, Michigan, close to Grand Rapids, and I have a son in Chicago. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, tonight, for instance, we'll get together with my daughter who's here and her family, and they'll just come over for dinner, and we'll sit around and just be together. Uh, the the things that everybody looks forward to the most is after dinner. The conversation mm-hmm. just can go anywhere. Um, I, uh, another little anecdotal thing with my family in terms of being with them, we, we just, we enjoy each other's company. We like to be together. I think that's um, a lot of what family is about. And so when my kids ask me, um, Dad, what do you want for your birthday or what do you want for Christmas? Uh, and I, I don't want to sound self-serving this way, but I always say, I just want you to be here. Yeah. Because having the having the four kids together, they're very close. I, uh, my wife developed that as they were growing up as children and into their adolescence and even their young adulthood. And so they're very close, and just to be, just to be with them, uh, present with them when they're together. They all have great senses of humor. They love each other, um, and to just be there when they're interacting, it, it's just a joy. So, um, yeah, I, it's those are just cherished, precious times, and uh, we it, we enjoy each other. I think that's the big thing. My my wife and I's family dynamic, Gary, just echoes what you just said. Um, this week, my oldest daughter was in town from Bloomington. Her husband's in Jamaica doing some ministry. And so my, my oldest daughter was able to come home. And one evening, I was sitting at our dinner table, and all of my children were around the table with my wife. And um, yes. it, it was a moving moment. And I'm truly a rich man. And I'm sure you can yep. echo those words as well. Exactly. Yep. Gary, you know, sometimes as educators and ministers, um, we, we know we get busy and um, sometimes we get overwhelmed. Um, Gary, in your life and even currently, what's something that you do maybe to unpack or what kind of hobbies do you enjoy? Uh, you know, a lot of stuff. I I love music. I, I love all sorts of music. I, I have to admit, and, and maybe some will turn us off. But I like rock music, and I uh, I listen to a lot of rock music mm-hmm. and enjoy it. I, I just kind of archive things, uh, like I'm like I'm doing something important, but it's not. But I I just love music. I, I like you know what I like riding my bicycle. Mm-hmm. Um, I I used to ride I used to ride hard. I used to ride for fitness, but now I I just like being on my bike and just mm-hmm. enjoy that. Um, I like to get out on the golf course when I can. Not very good, but I love it. Um, and I, uh, 
you know what? Um, I I love studying, so that has. I don't know if we should. Uh, it kind of is for me. I just mm-hmm. I like studying scripture and and anything related to scripture. So those are some of the things I do that just help me uh, enjoy some time off. I know every time we've had a Zoom meeting, Gary, the background of your Zoom meeting, you're surrounded by books in a library. So I knew that was probably going to be one of your answers. Yeah, those are all my friends that you see when you see my book. <laughs> Gary, let, let's transition here just a little bit, and um, let's talk about ministry, and let's talk about um, probably outside of family. Um, this is one of the things I enjoy the most is hearing leaders' testimonies and how they came to a faith in Jesus Christ. Tell us about how you came to know Jesus. Yeah, uh, that's always a fun thing to talk about as well. And uh, I I wish I had some kind of dramatic testimony that you often hear. I don't. I grew up in in a religious home, I think. Uh, My brother tells me that, uh, my older brother tells me that we attended what uh, well, well, I know we tended uh, an EUB church, Evangelical Union Brother. Mm-hmm. That uh, that was, gosh, that was when I was very young. I went to vacation Bible school. In any case, he told me that we that was an evangelical church at the time. So we were confronted with the truth about Jesus and the gospel. I don't. I, what I remember from that experience is I was at vacation Bible school. They they used to hand out these little. Uh, almost pamphlet-like things, a gospel of John. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I read that. I, I'd read it all the time. And I just, I thought Jesus was just a cool guy. I just, I, I kind of wanted to be like him. I, again, I didn't know what any of that meant. But uh, after my mother had passed, I was cleaning out some of the stuff in the attic, and I, I found that little gospel that I had read all the time. And in the back of it, it had one of the, what was the, essentially the four spiritual laws. Yeah. Or whatever. And I had signed that as a, like a 10 year old that I accepted Christ. Now, um, I, I don't know what your theology is and I, I'm not sure where I stood then, but I knew that I wanted to be like Jesus. And, um, again, didn't know what that meant. It wasn't until my senior year in high school, that a friend of mine invited me to church. Um, and I remember making a decision. Well, I, I, I like to say that Christ grabbed hold of me on January 17, uh, 1971. I was in, in, in the middle of my senior year in high school. Um, and uh, after that, I, I, shortly after that, I really sensed a call to ministry, uh, but I didn't do much with it because I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, I was in college, and so trying to find a church when I was away at school. I wasn't at a Christian school. And uh, uh, so I, I always had this sense of call, but uh, y- you might be able to identify a little bit with this, Trent, and maybe some of our listeners mm-hmm. can. Um, in those days, there was this weird thing that if, if it was something, if you felt God leading you in some direction, it was something that you liked and you wanted to do, well, that was obviously from Satan, and so you can't <laughs> do that because it, it, if you liked it and you wanted to do it, you were being deceived somehow. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, took me a, it took me a while to get beyond that, um, and eventually uh, I realized my call. Uh, I went to did a year of graduate school at Wheaton Graduate School. Uh, after I graduated with my BA, um, I went on to teach. I was sitting in a, a, a lunch with some students one day and the student said to me uh man you'd probably you'd be a good youth pastor um and i said okay and i left teaching and enrolled in seminary and watched god lead me through some some very interesting times into ministry so um that's kind of a brief encapsulation of the, the larger story you know gary it's so interesting that you you kind of made that comment you know, so many times I talk to people and, and even people going into ministry and they've got a certain gift and ability and interest and, and how they get to the point where they think, well, God doesn't want to use that gift or doesn't want to use that interest and they go a complete different direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember Gary, it was a year or so ago I was watching, I know you and I were football fans 
and and I was I was watching a certain NFL team, and a young rookie was drafted and got signed a contract and incredibly talented and and again I, I'm not trying to be the Holy Spirit for this young man, but he did an interview and said, you know. Um, today I, I signed, but I'm going to retire from football and, um, I'm called to preach and I'm going to pastor a church. And, and, you know, Gary, that's, that's a noble effort. But I remember that particular day, my wife was with me and I had a pillow in my hand and I threw it at the TV and screamed. (laughs) And, and the reason I did Gary is, you know, not many people get to make it to the NFL. Yeah. And given that platform with that voice, and I'm thinking, do you know how many people you can preach to with the platform you've just been given? Yes. And so, so many times God gifts and uh, gives us abilities and interests and what you just said, um, we're told, well, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing something else. And and I, I always encourage people, let, let's build upon what you're gifted at and what God has given you. Because I don't think God gives it to you just for you to throw it away. Right. Yeah. I talk with students all the time that way about, you know what, find out, learn, learn what your gift of this is, and then learn about that gift of this, know it. And then once you know that, just go after it with everything you've got. Amen. Amen. Pursue that exercise and give all your energy and your effort to it and your passion to it um, because, uh, I, I, you know this, and I know this, and I know this probably a little bit better than you, but time is short, yeah. and we don't have time to, and it's precious, and we don't have a lot of time to waste on stuff that just doesn't matter. So, so find your, your giftedness, and don't apologize for it. Just go after Amen. it and do what God has called you to do. Well, after that, Gary, I think we can be done. We just had church. And, and yeah. if, if no one gets anything else, if they get that, um, they're going to be doing a lot better. Yeah, I think so. Gary, talk to us a little bit about, because um, I, I know you're an academic, you've gotten higher degrees, I've loved our interaction, and we've talked on, on various theological things. How did you get interested in a collegiate role and teaching collegiately? Uh, you know, I, I started... I left college with a degree in uh, English literature as a teacher of English literature. And I just, um, I, I learned, it took, a, it took a long time for this evolved into what I just said, but over time I learned that, that I'm a teacher and I can do that. Mm-hmm. And I began to just, I, and I think that's part of, part of your gift in this, uh, this uh, comes into our whole conversation, all everything we just said. Part of our gift of this is that uh, uh, if if you like it, I mean that's not the, the the final test, but if you if this is something that that really is a passion, then you're probably gifted there. Yeah. Um, there there are other things that you need to look at, but I knew I wanted to teach, and I knew that I could teach. Um, and once I knew that, then, then things kind of really took off. But I thought, how can I use this gift of this because it's supposed to be for the church, how, how can I use it? And I felt, I just felt that uh, with with my inclination, um, my particular skill set, I thought the best place for me would be at a, at a college level. And I, I taught in some CEU programs and things, and then I realized, you know what? Um, I, I can teach at the college level, but I just don't have the credential to do it. Mm-hmm. And so I went and, I went and, and got a PhD so that I could teach on the college level. And uh, I just, again, to answer your question, I, I think that's, for me, that's the place where I can have the most impact uh, for the kingdom. So, uh, yeah, and I I taught in high school. And, uh, frankly, that, that just wasn't for me. I, I was, I didn't have the, uh, the patience or the temperament. Um, and this was... <laughs> That was back in the, the late 70s, 1970s. So uh, 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 high school was a different ch- kind of challenge. Amen to that, Gary. Um, so, so Gary, you, you, you started as a youth pastor, 
Yes. Were there any other roles that you fulfilled in, in pastoral ministry along the way? Uh, could, you, could you be a little bit more specific on that? Did, did you hold it? Were you hired as an executive pastor or senior pastor along your journey? I I became well. I was at a very large church in Akron uh, when I when I was on staff there, um, and uh, I had become there were about twenty seven guys on staff, mm -hmm. and I had become an associate pastor mm -hmm. um, in the, about the last half of my ministry at that church. So yeah, I've just been I I I went through the ranks. I started as a middle school pastor. We had. We had different classifications. The church was rather large. So I started middle school. I went to what we called ninth and 10th grade ministry. Uh, and then from that there, they asked me to, to do the college ministry. Um, and that's when they made me an associate pastor. But uh, I, guess, uh, I guess that counts as almost mm -hmm. exclusively being in youth ministry if you sure. had any college ministry there. Yeah. So, so I've always been able, even in teaching, um, and I think this is, I talked to my wife about it now as I'm getting older, I've always been able to establish rapport uh, with young people, be they high school students or college students. And I, I can still do that. I'm trying to keep my eye on it because I think that's one thing I need to look at in terms of when I might need to leave teaching if, if I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, Gary, my, my journey was, was pastoral ministry and collegiate teachings from the early 90s. I've always had one foot in both arenas and uh, was able to do that for quite a while. And I got to a point that my desire for educating leaders and pastors began to outgrow my heart for pastoral ministry. Yeah. And for me, Gary, there was a season of two or three years that I felt guilty about that. You know, how, how could I feel like this when I'm pastoring, but I'm feeling these other the other drawings? And it, it, was a, it was a season. So even if we got some listeners right now that God is doing some things in your heart, I encourage you, um, you know, begin to really interflect and begin to seek God on some things because he may have just a season change for you to be able to use your talents and abilities. And so it took me a couple years and um, I, I made the launch to academia full time. And there were still some seasons, Gary, in that I felt guilty. Um, yeah. But I began to realize that this is what I was made for, and I'm able to help people in ministry do things effectively. So um, I think those are some good words that Gary and I, you, you've, we've kind of flushed out here, it is you got to do what you're made to do. Yeah, exactly. Hey, can I uh, just kind of follow up on what you just Please, said? please. Uh, just for those listeners that you were speaking to, um, I think it's significant. Um, you mentioned it, but it might not have resonated as it should have. I, I got in 2008 when I left, when my wife and I left for Scotland to, to start our work at St. Andrews, uh, I was 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I, I left St. Andrews with my PhD at 55. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, um, it's it's not too late. It's never too late to say, "Hey, Amen. I, I need to make a change, and um, I need to do this to be prepared for that change." Change is a good thing. Uh, we sometimes it hurts and we don't like it and it can be uncomfortable, but ultimately, changes are, are usually good. Amen, Gary. Thank you for that. I, I'm telling you what, we're just going to have to label this podcast just um, do what God's called you to do and accept change. So. Hey, Gary, let, let's okay. jump into um, some things that I really, really want to spend some time with you on. And um, I know one of your favorite areas to teach is hermeneutics. And so I, I know most of our listeners may have a somewhat of a handle on this, but could you kind of just tell our listeners on, on a basic level, give them a quick lesson what hermeneutics is, Gary? Yeah, and let me, yeah, let me do that on a basic level, but let me mention that in the last, probably 50 years, hermeneutics has become almost philosophical and very popular outside the biblical realm. Mm -hmm. You and I, and, and probably most of the people listening, uh, consider 
hermeneutics, a, a biblical discipline. They understand principles of interpretation. But hermeneutics, because of the the postmodern shift, um, I think we're out, I think we're beyond postmodernism now. But yeah. in the postmodern shift at the end of the twentieth century, uh, hermeneutics became a philosophical discipline, and uh, that that affected how uh, well it, it kind of it shaped a new aspect of hermeneutics in biblical studies. And Anthony Thistleton, uh, the great hermeneutist. Um, he basically said hermeneutics uh, when we're using that term, and we, we we might use it to talk about general hermeneutics. Uh, you could you could probably go to certain universities today, secular universities, and take at least a, a minor in hermeneutics because it would be part of the philosophy department or something. Anyway, hermeneutics has to do in that sense with just thinking about what's going on when we interpret something. It's not talking about the process of interpretation in the sense of you do this first, you do this second, you do this third. It's hermeneutics denotes that that reflection upon the processes of interpretation. W- what are we doing when we're interpreting and trying to understand a text? So I, w- I wanted to say that because that matters today, that the mm-hmm. vernacular matters. But we usually, in, in, let's shift to the biblical realm, where we talk about biblical hermeneutics. Usually what we mean by that is uh, a discipline that looks at the principles of interpretation. In other words, it does look at the process of interpretation in terms of you do this, then you do this, and you do this. In other words, how do we go about interpreting or handling a passage of Scripture? And it usually has... You've mentioned to me in other conversations, it's an art and a science. Mm-hmm. It's a science because hermeneutics has rules. There are there are steps that you follow, and there are things that you do, and there are things that you don't do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's an art because you can you can develop a skill at doing it. And as you as you practice it more and more, proper hermeneutical principles, as you practice them more and more. You get better at it, and you learn the the nuances and the different things um, that are involved in hermeneutics, and uh, it it does become kind of an art form that way. Gary, we've got pastors and ministry leaders leaders that are listening. Why is it a good practice for them to, to implement good biblical hermeneutics in their study and also sermon preparation? Yeah, certainly um, both of those are so important for, I think, two things. For accurate, uh, no, I don't necessarily say right interpretation, although I don't think that's a bad thing to say, but mm-hmm. accurate interpretation. In, anytime uh, you're, you're, you're seeking meaning in a text, you're interpreting. So interpret or uh, the some elite pastor or some elite academic, everybody interprets. The question isn't uh, what kind of do I want to interpret scripture. If you're reading it and trying to think, what does this mean to me uh, and to us as the church? You're interpreting anytime you do that. So the question is, what kind of interpreter do you want to be? Do you want to be lazy, careless, and negligent, or do you want to be responsible, conscientious, and informed? And so. Those those principles, the, the 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 whole discipline of hermeneutics becomes important for the pastor, uh, so that they can accurately interpret. First, secondly, they can communicate God's word uh, to people in a way that they understand it. So that that's kind of why I like this this area and this discipline. It's it's such an important part of ministry and preaching and teaching. Gary, years of ministry, I, I've certainly seen passages um, interpreted um, not well, let's say like that, where you could tell the person who explained the text really didn't use good hermeneutical principles. And by doing that, I've seen people hurt, wounded, limited, ostracized, yes. And using a scriptural text to leverage damage on people's lives, and that was that's always been something in my heart that 
as a pastor, I wanted to make sure that I leveraged and used a text properly that brought life to people and didn't cause damage. Yeah, well, well said. And it, it, if you did just that, and I know you, <laughs> you did much more than that when you dealt with texts, but if you did, did just that, um, you, you applied so many different hermeneutical principles, whether you knew it or not, that are just so important uh, because, again, we're called as teachers and preachers to communicate God's truth to people. Man, that's a huge responsibility, Amen. and it's a it's a great one. I, I accept it, but I I accept and and know that responsibility. So it's it's a I, I think there's a there's a, there's a sense in which we have to have that very high view of Scripture. I don't want want to be a bibliolater, mm-hmm. um, but I want to I want to maintain that very high view of the authority uh, of Scripture, and, and I want to be able to communicate that truth to people in a way that it's transformative for them and that it builds their lives. And so, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll say it in an absolute way. I think the only way to do that is to be a good interpreter. And to understand hermeneutical principles and and how we go about interpreting a text to communicate it to a group of people. Amen. You you know, Gary, I think as pastors at some point in time we're always guilty, um, but more and more I see evidence of what I'm about to say. And I was wondering if you could unpack a couple terms for our listeners, exegesis and isogesis. Yeah, um, exegesis um, is, generally speaking, when you put it in that context of exegesis and eisegesis, exegesis is uh, letting the text speak. So it it has to do with the mindset with with which you come to the text. You're not bringing anything to it. And that's when you start bringing something to the text— that's when we start talking about eisegesis, where mm. we're reading things into the text from, who knows, from an ideology, from current events, from, uh, we're, we're reading things into the text. They're, they're not coming out of the text. We might think they are, and that's the danger of it. Usually those who, who are guilty of eisegesis uh, believe that that's, that's coming out of the text, but it mm-hmm. isn't. We're reading it into the text. So eisegesis is, uh, I'm sorry, exegesis is is letting the text speak. And there are certain principles for that. And I joke with my students, uh, but it's becoming a very effective joke because Dr. College is known for his three principles of hermeneutics. And the first one is context. The second principle of hermeneutics is context. And the third principle is context. Context is everything. Amen. And there are there are different contexts that we have to consider. I, I don't know if we have time for that or not, but con- we know what we mean, at least by literary context. We hear it all the time. Well, I was taken, my statement was taken out of context. Out of context. Yeah, that's a literary, that's a literary expression of um, that, we didn't see it in, if we're looking at a passage of Scripture, we look at uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, for instance. Well, we have to read that in the context of the first four verses that come before it, mm-hmm. or we're not going to get it. Uh, we we look at those verses, and that's the kenosis passage, and we do all that theology there. And Paul isn't theologizing in that passage. He's ethicizing, and, and how do I know that? because of what it says in the first four verses. Mm-hmm. So when we put it in context, then we're letting the text speak to us. And that's that's a part of exegesis, not the whole thing, but it's it's part of it. If we bring our theology to the text, and we we, we almost use that as a proof text, or we'll see my theology. Is Correct. There. That's eisegesis. So we don't want to do that. Um, and again, that's that's part of the artistic element of hermeneutics. And, and actually, that's based on a principle of hermeneutics, 
but it's actually part of the art of understanding, oh, this is how context is used. And, if, uh, and I know we're, we're probably pressed for time here, but I'll, there's, there's, a, there's a third context. The first context is historical, cultural context. The second context is literary context. The third one that we don't, uh, th that we often miss is what in hermeneutics we call pre-understanding. And that is this, that's, that's pre-understanding is bringing ourselves mm -hmm. to the text. We have to recognize that as an individual, uh, our ethnicity, our family, our geographical location, our education, our entertainment choices, uh, everything builds this pre-understanding. We bring a whole person to the text. It's yeah. not a bad thing. That's that's not bad. It's different. That's much different than saying, well, we bring prejudice to the text or we bring presuppositions. Yeah. Pre-understanding is just we read a text a particular way. What is important about that to say with regard to hermeneutics is we need to understand that we do that. It's it's not oh, I'm doing something wrong. No, we need to understand and we need to think about is my pre-understanding are the lenses through which I'm reading this distorting this text from what God wants to say here. So that context pre-understanding is an important piece that helps us uh exegete and not eisegete just just being aware of it that we know i bring I, i'm seeing the text through a particular lens is that distorting the text yeah and i, I think that pre-understanding helps us identify some of those gaps you know whether it's yeah. a, a time gap covenant gap so on and so forth that deval and hayes talk about yes exactly yep well, gary um what are some good resources or maybe some good books that you could encourage some of our pastoral listeners here that if they don't have it in their libraries or something they can access, what would you recommend to them? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, Herm there's a book on hermeneutics. When I talked about general hermeneutics, uh, I think it's something that the pastors should be informed about. Um, and there's a good book, uh, by Stanley Porter and Beth Stovall. Mm -hmm. They edit the book. It's called Biblical Harmony Five Views. And if you're not familiar with that that general hermeneutics idea that I spoke briefly about at the very beginning, this book will help work through. It it just it talks about different uh hermeneutical methodologies because we you you and I basically have been talking here about the historical grammatical method that probably most of our listeners, they may not know it by that name, but they, mm -hmm. they know the historical grammatical method. There are other ways to, to uh, come to Scripture on their orientations, and this book, Biblical Hermeneutics, talks about that. So if, if one of your listeners would be interested in that aspect of it, otherwise, in terms of uh, basic hermeneutical principles, you mentioned Duval and Hayes, they have a wonderful book. We use it as a textbook in the undergraduate mm -hmm. program, Grasping God's Word, which they call it the interpretive journey. It's just correct. All it's their version of the historical grammatical method, and it it does walk. It, it looks at interpretation as a journey, and it walks you through the steps of that journey. Very, and but it's it, it's good that way, and it's simple. But it's not simplistic. It is. It's a excellent book on uh, the historical grammatical method. Uh, it, it, one more is a Klein Blomberg Hubbard book, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Uh, that's a little more technical, but still a, a good undergraduate uh, level book. And then Grant Osborne's The Hermeneutical Spiral. Uh, any more technical, pro I would probably place that uh, to an entry-level seminary book. Uh, but yeah, those those four books are have always uh, been good to me, and I, well, I, I, I they're on my shelf, and I use them all the time. If our listeners don't have those, I encourage you to get those in your in your library, and um, 
I, I know the Center for Thriving Leaders has some of those in our repository, and um, those that were not, I'll make sure they're in there if you want to contact the Center for Thriving Leaders. Gary, as we end our conversation today, um, two last questions I have for you. You're, you're a minister. You're an academic. Um, you, you currently um, are an administrator and faculty member for Grace at the Akron campus. Uh, from, from what you are seeing, engaging with people going to ministry, in your opinion, how can seminaries um, help and train, equip pastors better today, do you think? Uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm experiencing what, what Grace is doing. So, uh, and I, I've, I've been involved in some other institutions. Um, and I think what, what we're doing, um, is on the right track in the sense that I, I think what we're trying to do is help. And, and train future leaders of the church to know scripture mm. and to know it well. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds almost uh, cliched, but um, the more and more I talk with people in churches, uh, there the thing I hear all the time is, well, we don't really know the Bible that well. Mm. Um, and so I think the main thing that we need to do in the seminaries, in the in the school, just make sure these students uh, know scripture. Yeah, I I'm an academic, and uh, I'm in Akron. Uh, I'm known as the academic sheriff, and hmm. so people look at me as, yeah, you're you're a little over the top. Well, I don't think I am. Mm -hmm. um, I I think our students they need to know the Bible, but they need to know it at a level. Um, that that is that has academic rigor to it. Amen. I know that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, uh, but I think more and more, um, you know, you, and I'm sure your listeners are, are seeing this too. There are more good, solid questions being asked by people today than there have been at any time in the past. Mm. That's largely because of the internet and technology that people ask questions that they see on the internet somewhere that they think, wow, that's a great question. I would, I would have never thought to ask that. And these are some sometimes very hard questions that pastors receive. Um, and we're just going to need to be better uh, at, at knowing scripture, knowing theology, knowing those things that uh, are at the heart of the answers of these questions. Amen. And uh, uh, so I think I was, I read a book, uh, Faith for Exiles by David Kinnaman mm -hmm. and a guy named Matlock. And Kinnaman works for the Barman Group. And so it's got a lot of the st statistics. Um, and I would encourage readers to read that. It's 2019. So, you, you know, um, it's, it's getting kind of old now because of the kind of data that it works with. But it's still it's still relevant. And one of the things they say is the church is going to have to be better in that academic area. Now, I always want the I want the academy to be the academy. I want the church to be the church. Uh, but there there is a gap between them. I think that that gap has to be narrowed to where we start to mesh as as I think God intended us to be. Yeah, you need to know scripture and you need to know how to take care of your family. You need to know how to raise teenagers and you mm -hmm. need to know what makes a good marriage. Mm -hmm. But all of that stuff on solid theological truth. And so, yeah, we, um, and I, yeah, this, this is coming from the academic share. So, yeah, I think we need to be more, uh, a little more academic. I need to get a badge made for you, Gary, an old sheriff's badge. This is the academic yeah. sheriff that you can wear around. Yeah. Hey, Gary, here we're at the moment that I always love to ask my guests. And um, what is a lasting comment, thought, encouragement from 
someone who's been in ministry, someone who's preached, someone who teaches hermeneutics, a leader. Um, what's one last life encouragement comment you could leave with our ministry leaders, Gary? Yeah, I'm going to go back to, I said it earlier, learn, learn your giftedness, know your giftedness. Pursue that and exercise that giftedness. Don't just become a student of yourself and your giftedness, but learn it so that you can exercise it uh, with all your energy, all your energy, your effort, your passion, um, and 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 know that God, wherever you are in ministry, God has gifted you. He, and, and yes, let, let me. I, I I'm supposed to just give you a sentence here, but. Uh, he's gifted you. I know everybody has a mentor and, and uh, authors that they like, but he's gifted you. You're not that that mentor, that author. They're learn from them, but don't imitate them. You be you, because God has called you to ministry. So know know that know your giftedness, and, and just just go after that with everything you got. Amen. We've just been listening to Dr. Gary College, the faculty support specialist at the Akron Campus for Grace College and Seminary. What a special time, Gary, we've had today. Today, I just thank you so much for your time, Gary. Yeah, I've enjoyed it very much, Trent. Thank you again. Uh, very honored by this invitation uh, and to be able to talk with you. Listeners, I hope you got all that today, some rich conversation of life, ministry, hermeneutics, and just make sure that you stay in your lane and do what God's called you to do. Thanks again, Gary. Yeah, you bet, Trent. Thanks. This is Dr. Trent Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders and Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us. Hope you listen next time. This is Dr. Trent Lambert with the Center for Thriving Leaders and Grace Theological Seminary, challenging you to keep thriving in ministry. Thanks for joining us today.